become un un unstable. This whole system is deeply flawed, and that's why I talk a lot about free markets and property rights, Austrian economics, and getting rid of the Fed. All these things are now uh, up for grabs. A lot of people, especially the young people, are looking at this. So for this reason, I'm a bit encouraged by uh, you know what might come out of this. But I think we're going to go through the ringer. I think it's going to get much, much worse, and it's bad enough already. But there's no way that we can step back. The one thing I'm convinced of after having spent so much time in Washington is that this will not be a gradual recovery from this disaster that we have. We're not going to elect enough people and enough courage to vote the right way. And, and uh, there's too much demagoguing and too much misunderstanding that people would revolt. But the collapse will come. It's going to hit the dollar. And then we're going to have our opportunity. So the more people who are protected... Uh, intellectually as well as financially, the better off we'll be in rebuilding what we'll have, uh, what we'll need to do in the near future. Buckle your seatbelt. It's time for another episode of the Prepper Recon Podcast. Whether your plan is to bug out or bug in, CampingSurvival.com has all of your preparedness needs, including fish antibiotics, long-term storage food, water filters, bug out bags, and first aid kits. Use coupon code PREPPERRECON for 5% off your entire order at CampingSurvival.com. When disaster strikes, it's too late to prepare. PrepperRecon.com offers Molly compatible individual first aid kits for your home, auto, or bug out bag. These kits have everything you need to address a traumatic injury, including an Israeli battle dressing, quick cloth, EMT shears, suture kit, stera strips, tourniquet, ACS chest seal, tough strip bandages, gauze, and so much more. $89 includes shipping. To buy your individual first aid kit, go to PrepperRecon.com and click the store tab at the top of the homepage. Order today before it's too late. Today's guest is Gary Collins. Gary, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me on, Mark. Absolutely. Uh, now, you've got an extensive resume. Can you hit some of the highlights of what you've done for some of our new listeners that maybe didn't catch you last time you were on the show? Oh, absolutely. It's a, I'll keep it short. It's a long story. But uh, grew up small town. Uh, grew up in the sticks and uh, hunting, fishing. Went to uh, college and uh, majored in criminal justice. Got a criminal justice degree. Then was in military intelligence and got a master's degree in forensic science while I was in the military. And then became a federal agent for the U.S. Uh, State Department, Diplomatic Security Service. And then from there went to uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and at the end the Food and Drug Administration as a special agent. And I'm also a adjunct college professor in criminal justice investigations. So there's a lot, a lot of moving parts, and now I'm a health guy. I'm a health guru. I'm a primal slash kind of paleo guy. I call it just uh, self-sufficiency health, survivalist health, um, that it fits into the primal paleo kind of genre. Um, and that's what I do now, but I'm also a survivalist far as enthusiast and follower and I'm an off-the-grid guy. I've been working on my off-the-grid project for two years now. And do you want to tell us a little bit about your move to go off-grid, and when did you get started with that? Yeah, it actually started quite a while ago. Um, I put the initial plan in place about eight years ago. So it's been a long, drawn-out uh, kind of plan, and it became just starting to look for the land and how to – you know, go out and find, you know, some remote property. It's, it's far more difficult than I thought it would be, but it came from, you know, I grew up, like I said, I grew up in a small town. I grew up hunting, fishing, living in the sticks, hiking, doing all the outdoor stuff as kids used to do back in the day that now kids aren't allowed to, unless they got a mouthpiece helmet and uh, full body armor on. And, you know, that's how I lived. So after, you know, I kind of graduated from college and got into, you know, more city living and was with the federal government for a long time and traveling to big cities, I just got burned out on all of it. And so this was my way of going back to kind of where I came from, but a little more, you know, more of the off grid style because I wanted to not be tied to the system anymore as far as public utilities. I wanted to be re more remote where it was quiet. So yeah, I started looking about eight years ago and I just, kind of plotted out four or five states in the country that I liked 
and started narrowing it down. And eventually I narrowed it down to Washington State and then further narrowed it down to the northeast portion of Washington State um, because that's more uh, the west side I call the west side of Washington, California light, because it's basically the same thing. I'm from California, born and raised. And so, yeah, just been on a journey the last two years, bought the land uh, two years ago, a little over two years ago now, and have been developing it since. And uh, we had you on the show last year. And what have you completed since the last time you were on the show? Um, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Um, it's a slow process, uh, and I'm writing a book on it as well. Um, I'm getting ready to get the rough draft done, hopefully in the next two to four weeks. And I'm documenting it as I go because I felt that if I didn't, <laughs> I'd forget. And at the end, I would write it, and it would be far different than writing it as I go and following this journey. But, yeah, it's, uh, right now I have the land. Uh, the roads are all done. Uh, septic's in. Well is in and running. I have partial solar up and charging batteries, and I have the house dried in, which means it's just a, a box with a roof on it and windows right now. There's really not much else to it, just kind of boxed in uh, to protect it from the weather. Um, and my fences are up, my security perimeter's up. So I'm pretty far along, uh, not too bad, but that took two years. So uh, people always think, uh, and I did too, that you can go much faster. The problem is there's no financing, so it's cash. And you got to kind of plot and go as far as you can with the money you have. And uh, what talk to us about your solar setup. What do you got? Right now, what I have is I have a total of six 300-watt panels, so it's 1.8 megawatts, but I only have two up right now, two of the panels. Um, and it's basically consists of a charge controller, you know, an inverter system, and I've got eight batteries. I'm running a 48-volt system, so it's, it's running on uh, – eight six volt batteries right now and i'm going to be putting the wind in uh, my turbine in next year so i'll have wind power to supplement because where i'm at i have quite a bit of wind at the top of the the hill the mountain there and uh, that's basically it right now i mean it's the system it sounds real basic but it's actually pretty complicated now uh, the technology's come a long way and there's a lot going on I mean, there's just a lot of system checks and it's all, you know, digitally monitored. And so you kind of kind of I'm still learning it and reading up on it and trying to figure it all out. But that's my basic system and it will run. That alone will run my my house. Um, it should run it. No problem. Of course. Now, when you say you're running an off grid house on uh, on solar, though, uh, folks have to be aware that that probably means not much in the way of air conditioning. Uh, yeah. probably not any big super sized, uh, freezers. Um, you know, it's, y you really have to kind of pick and choose what you're going to operate because, uh, a solar setup, I found out real quick, just setting up a little small backup one for, you know, when we lose power here, uh, the batteries, especially they get expensive fast. Everything else oh. is, everything yeah. else is, is fairly, uh, inexpensive in comparison to the batteries, but those batteries can really add up. Well, and that's part of the experiment this year because um, obviously I couldn't live there in the winter because I would freeze to death because I don't have enough of it done. But yeah, I have to leave the batteries. Uh, my electrician who helped me put everything in, he's going to go up there and check on it. But yeah, the batteries, just those eight batteries I have, that's 2500 bucks, And that's a small battery bank. So yeah, it, it's you. You have to change when you're doing this. You have to completely change your mindset on how you're going to live and what you feel is important. And that is you're dead on. There is no central air conditioning or heating. That is out right away. Um, you could go geothermal, but geothermal is super expensive. Um, I think it's about thirty grand for a small system for me, and that just was way outside of the realm of making sense. Um, you can do your own. I mean, there's do it yourself for all this stuff, but man, when I looked into it, it just, <laughs> it just makes things rather difficult. And if you screw something up, you, you pay dearly, you know, you screw those batteries up. There's 2,500 bucks like that done. So, you know, I kind of did, uh, I'm doing a hybrid of do it yourself 
in working with contractors. But yeah, I, I'm not going to have, I'll have a small refrigerator. You know, I will not have an electric stove. Everything, you know, your stove's going to run on propane. Your oven's going to run on propane. Um, your water heater's going to run on propane. It'll be tankless is the most efficient way to go. And the igniter is, it, the igniter runs, the ones they have now actually runs off uh, the force of the water and it self ignites. So you're not even drawing electricity through uh, the tankless water heater. So yeah, it gets, it gets tricky and your, you know, your pump well or your well pump is, you know, that has to run off electricity. So you have to have a low draw well pump and yeah, it's just, your lighting all has to be led. You can't have a 70 inch TV, you know, running. So you just have to be careful. I mean, yeah, there's just, ceiling fans you know you're going to be using uh, propane heat more than likely and a wood stove problem is you know as i'm learning the codes are really tricky and they're changing fast you know you used to be able to get away with a lot more but that's not the case anymore they're really tightening down on the building codes for remote building um it's there's no difference you just can't throw something up and live in it and say here i am you know, the county assessor will come out. They'll find what you're doing. They have Google Earth. My little town's 1,800 people. It's the smallest. It's the biggest town in my county, but they know. They know exactly what you're doing on your property. So, yeah, you got to be careful. And there's something like 2.3 billion square feet of uh, self-storage units in America. Hoarding junk is just kind of like a, a national pastime in America. Yep. Does that get in the way when you're trying to move off the grid? Because, uh, you know, as you're explaining everything, you know, everything, doing something off grid is much more expensive and much more difficult. And like you said, you can't get financing for it. And and so I guess every square foot that you add, you're adding cost. So, uh, you know, if a lot of that square footage is just for keeping stuff you're never going to need, is that is that something you have to think about? Well, absolutely. Even in my new place, I mean, the closet space is probably a quarter of the storage and closet space I've had in the past. Um, and that's the thing when you first start is what I did is I purged everything. I basically went through this whole downsizing uh, kind of road over four years. You know, I sold my house. Then I moved into a small cottage, which was around 475 square foot. And then I eventually moved into my travel trailer. And then as I, as I started my off the grid property. So I, when I went into it, I didn't have much stuff left. All I basically kept were clothes, tools, and like my road and mountain bike. I mean, that's what I had, you know, there, you, you really are cognizant of what you own now. And yeah, with that, you know, you can't build a monstrosity and just store a bunch of crap in it. It, it just isn't going to work because it does, it eats up resources in building an off-the-grid house, I'm torn on – I've been dealing with contractors, and I've been dealing with them for almost 20 years now. Uh, I used to, I've used i owned several properties. I've had investment properties. I've had investment land. I mean I've been dealing with these knuckleheads for a long time. And, you know, I'm torn on the, the greatly – the smaller you go, the, the higher per square foot it is. It is and it isn't. <laughs> I think that's contractor speak. Of telling you, well, your project isn't going to be as profitable for me, so I'm going to have to upcharge you because it's smaller. That's a story we can get into. But yeah, you are correct, though. When you start building smaller, certain things are going to cost more. You know, if you have to get a, you know, say, you know, uh, a pump truck up there for cement. Well, if you're building a big house, well, it's going to cost less because you, you're paying for a per square foot, it's going to be a smaller imprint than if you have to bring that pump truck up for a house that's a third of that size. You're still paying the same price for the pump truck, but you know you don't have the square footage, so that's going to increase it. So yeah, you have to think about that. You can't just jam a big closet in there because now you got to pay for the closet, and you're not financing it. You're you're paying for that closet as you build it, so and the storage space. So yeah, you got to be really particular about how you build it. I actually started off with a – I think my original plan was I was going to build a house around five to 600 square foot. But once I started looking at it, it was, it was too small in the sense of it is an investment property even though it's an off-the-grid property. 
and you still have to look at it that way because if you have to sell it, you have a real hard time selling a 500 square foot house. You know, um, you kind of narrow your demographic drastically. So I went, you know, let me get it closer to a thousand. And that way, you know, a couple and maybe, you know, one or two kids could could live in it. And that way it's a little it, it opens up who I would could sell to if I ever had to. I don't plan to, but you never know. Things happen in life. So mine's going to be right around, uh, I think it's around 968 square foot. It's time for a quick break, and we'll be right back. The dollar's lost over 90% of its purchasing power since 1971. Silver, on the other hand, has proved to be a very stable form of wealth preservation over the years. And where do you buy silver? Silver.com, of course. Silver.com offers fantastic prices on silver and gold. We talk a lot about food storage on the Prepper Recon podcast, but just as important is knowing that you have a way to cook the food that you're storing. Sun Oven is a great way to cook with the energy of the sun, and they have a great deal for Prepper Recon podcast listeners. It's $80 off a deluxe package, which includes a turkey roasting rack, especially for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Just go to PrepperRecon.com and click the Sun Oven banner on the right-hand side of the homepage. I think one of the things that, that preppers have to think about, because, you know, the small house movement, that's kind of big now, the tiny house yeah. thing and, and the tiny house on the trailer and all of that. Uh, I think one of the things that preppers have to think about that, uh, the big thing is food storage, because, you know, we're all looking to try to have uh, some yeah. type of a buffer in case we have to... Uh, convert to producing our own food you know there's a little learning curve in that and it, it takes you a little while to to get the, the crops and everything going hopefully folks have already gotten over the learning curve and it's just a matter of you know having to up the production that they're already doing uh if they ever get in that type of situation uh but uh do you have any recommendations for that would you recommend putting up just like a separate like a storage shed because that's so much cheaper than than you know, foundations and, you know, all the different codes, especially that you have to have uh, for building an off-grid uh, property for that, that's, that has a livable space. And you don't necessarily need livable space for your storage. Is that right? Correct. And yeah, I had to look into that. I've looked at many different avenues. Actually, I just finished the chapter on tinny houses in my book because it's become a big fad and there's shows dedicated to it. And to give people an example... I live in my travel trailer now. It's a 23-foot travel trailer. Nothing nothing big, nothing stupendous. Well, comparably, a teeny home on wheels compared to my trailer, so I put it kind of general size, even though they're different beasts um, in how they're set up, it cost, when I did it online and put all the pieces in it for it to have, you know, air conditioning, heating, you know, actual plumbing, not pooping in a bucket, because a lot of them do that. Um, you know, having a normal, basically equivalent of a travel trailer, RV, it was over $70,000 for a 24-foot teeny home on a moving chassis, on a rolling chassis. My travel trailer cost, I bought a 2014 brand new, got a good deal. It was $16,900. Already ready to go. It has everything you need. And I think... A lot of people are getting sucked into the teeny home movement because they look at it compared to a normal house. And sure, it's cheaper, but when you do the average per square foot, it's a ripoff. I mean, you're looking at maybe, maybe $10,000 in materials. And then the guy's going to upcharge you 60 plus grand on top of the materials to build it. Man, these guys are coming out of the woodworks because they see quick cash and they see you coming. You know, now you've got basically a shed on wheels because that's what they are they're basically a barn on wheels they're super top heavy they weigh a ton i mean they weigh over most of them weigh over ten thousand pounds they're super heavy they're dangerous to pull they're hard to pull you got to register them with dmv just like a normal travel trailer they have to be certified to roll on the road <sighs> i just don't think it's a smart way to go for a hundred to 150 foot square foot like I said, shack on wheels, when you can build a tra you know, a normal storage shed for under five grand, that's much bigger than that. Um, and you can move it. Mine's movable. You know, I, and anything usually under 200 square foot, you don't need a permit for. 
that's what I found is that seems to be the cutoff when you're dealing with building codes for a storage shed is once you start getting over 200 square foot, now you need a permit. So, yeah, I'm not a big fan of the teeny home movement, if you couldn't tell. I think it's a fad, and usually with fads, that means someone's <laughs> getting ripped off. Yeah. Yeah, and, and like you said, that that's that's a really small space to, to, to try to have anything in for a, for a prepper, you know, and uh, and you could you could pretty much, you know, if it was just you were just looking to, to have something for a roof, you can go to Home Depot or Lowe's yeah. and they'll usually deliver uh, a decent sized shed that you could put a couple of cots in, uh, you know, not plumbed and not electric and, and, and nothing like that, but just something that would be sort of on the order of like a, a, a hunting cabin. And, you know, if yep. you wanted, you could, you could pour up, you know, if you had some, some bare land somewhere, you could probably get somebody to pour you a, a, a slab and, and drop it on the slab or, or, or whatever. Or just raised, uh, like I did for my house, I have a raised floor. Um, because of that, my, my shed's on a raised floor too. And the reason I did that so I can move it. And uh, it just makes things a lot easier. Not the house, obviously. The house was so, um, during the winter, I wouldn't have to worry about my foundation cracking. And if any pipes ever cracked, having to crack a slab. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can go to Home Depot. And I saw, I was just at Home Depot. And I saw a nice shed with a loft in it, roughed in, I think it was like 5400 bucks. And it was nice. I mean, it was a nice shed. And I know a guy who actually bought a good, a pretty big shed, and he turned it into his hunting cabin. He had a, a construction background, but he didn't want to have to frame it and start from scratch and haul the lumber up there. So what he did is he bought the shed because it was the equivalent of what it would have cost him to build pretty much. And then he retroed it to a cabin, and he did it and finished it off. And the, the, the codes for a hunting cabin are different than a residential home. And that's, I mean, it gets tricky. Oh my God, the codes and all the stuff I'm having to learn and figure out. And that's a good thing too, to talk about is people is doing it right now. And that's where I'm a little different. Um, a lot of these shows will show people just kind of not following the rules per se. And that just throwing something up and doing it cheap is the best way to go. But like I said, the county knows now. I mean, with Google Earth, you're not getting away with stuff. Um, the assessor was in my remote area and hit every neighbor, just hit everyone. I mean, places that you, you wouldn't even think to find, they found them all. They found every property and left a card and did an assessment, you know, for county taxes. So, you know, you can cut corners, but you're going to get hit in the end. I mean, you're going to get hit with a massive tax bill. You're going to get hit with penalties. And now you've got the county upset and now they're looking at you. That's just not the way to go. Yeah, and once you're on the radar, it's tough to get off. Yeah, exactly, because now they're going to be going probably to your property every year instead of every four years. You know, you're on the special list. And, you know, and you know what I found is by doing it right and showing up and putting, getting the proper permit package in and doing everything correctly, the county's been really helpful with me. You know, they've, they've really helped me out and making sure that I'm doing it right and they know I'm not trying to cut corners. I'm just trying to do it. But, you know, I'm not a professional builder. You know, I don't know all the codes. And I've found the contractors don't know them either. They're just as lost half the time because the codes are changing quickly. And uh, you're writing a book about your experience, like you, you mentioned. Yeah. Do you have a, a target release date for that? I'm going to try and get it out before uh, this uh, summer 2016. Um, and what I'm doing, I'm splitting it up into into three pieces, and this is kind of the beginning phase of how to get your find your property, put in the basic system, get your house built, and then it will be you know a continuation of kind of my journey. And as I'm learning and teaching people how I did it, because what I've found is the journey is very individual, and everyone goes a different direction. There's no roadmap for it, and the hardest part's been for me is trying to figure it out. Because there's really nothing out there to show you how to do it and give you the basics like, you know, off the grid communications. Oh, my God. I had to spend months figuring out Internet connection and devices to use cell phone boosters at work. And then 
cell phone boosters that work with routers won't work with internet satellite and internet satellite providers are different and oh it I mean just it, it took so much time and effort to figure out just basic things that I'm trying to write it to help someone so they don't have to spend all that time, you know, researching all this stuff. I'll at least give them a place to start. So sure. that's the goal of it. Sure. Yeah. Cause I mean, uh, uh, stuff like that, when you're first going into it, you don't even know what you don't know. Exactly. I went into it and, uh, I, I remember, uh, one of my buddies was laughing at me cause, uh, He's all, you don't seem to really have a plan. And I go, well, I do. It, it, there's a plan. It's a chaotic one. But I went, I just don't know. I went, I don't know how I'm going to make this work and how I'm going to do it. You know, because just finding a contractor. I'll tell you right now, even though off-the-grid living is far more popular than it used to be, good luck finding a contractor who knows how to build anything off the grid. They don't. I mean, to this day, I still haven't found it. The first one claimed he did. He didn't know anything. Uh, he just said he did. He was clueless. And that's a difficult part, too, is, you know, well, how do you do it if you can't even get a contractor to figure this stuff out? Well, you just have to search around, and hopefully you find someone who's at least done some of it. And if not, you know, they'll work with you and not charge you. That's a problem, too, is they may not know how to do it, but they'll charge you to learn it on the fly, and that I don't agree with that process what whatsoever but it's it's a difficult build it really is well thanks so much for making time to come on the show with us today uh where do folks go if they want to follow your off the grid progress um i have my website uh, my main website which is www.primalpowermethod.com and all my social media is linked on there, and I post all of my uh, – on my blog post, I'm documenting everything and all my YouTube videos. Then you can go to YouTube, and it's just uh, uh, www.youtube.com forward slash Primal Power Method, and you'll see all my videos, and uh, you'll see the process, and I show the shed and house and kind of show you how it's coming along. Um, I plan to do a lot more videos. I got stuck this year scrambling and I wasn't able to do as many videos as I would have liked, but I'm hoping to do a lot more next year when I get up there. And then you mentioned your, your, uh, primal power. And, uh, of course we're going to have you back on in January to talk about that because every, every January we try to do a, a nice series that gets folks back to the basics. And we always try to cover personal preparedness and, uh, you know, and unfortunately, that's one of the things that that preppers really fall short in is uh, is staying in shape and eating right and getting exercise. So, uh, yeah. we're we'll looking forward to having you back on the show for that. And that's a big one. Uh, we've talked about that before, and I've talked about you know, for all of us who are you know trying to make our life easier, prepping and being survivalist and self sufficient and self efficient. It it's it starts with your health, and because people kind of look at me sideways and go, "What's a health guy?" nutrition and exercise guy have to do with survivalism and, and prepping. And I, when I tell them it, it, it's actually the first key you need to accomplish and you need to work on it and I explain it to them, they kind of go, oh, you know, that does make sense. You know, it does you no good to uh, be prepared and, and have a homestead if you can't live five miles away from any hospital or medical clinic because you're unhealthy. Very good point. Thanks again for t making time to come on the show, Gary. Thanks, Mark. In the days of Noah, book three, Perdition, a global empire arises like a phoenix from the ashes of the world that was. The emerging order is unified by a new global currency and a single world religion, which are mandated by an imposed UN treaty. In the interest of unity and peace, a zero-tolerance policy for dissenters is enacted and strictly enforced. Hunted down like common criminals for daring to resist the state, Noah Parker's group will have to rely on faith and wits to endure the powers of darkness which are quickly consuming the earth. Buy your copy of The Days of Noah, Book 3, Perdition, by best-selling author Mark Goodwin in paperback, Kindle, or audio edition from Amazon.com today.